The Essence of Yoga, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Book 1, Sutra 2, a comparative study course by Dr. Lisa Love using the books Light on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali by BKS Iyengar, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali by Sri Swami Satchidananda, and Light of the Soul, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali by Alice Bailey. So let's look at what Book 1, Sutra 2 says, according to our three authors. Sri Swami Satchidananda translates the Sanskrit as saying the restraint of the modifications of the mind stuff is yoga. BKS Iyengar translated as saying yoga is the cessation of movements in the consciousness. And Alice Bailey says this union or yoga is achieved through the subjugation of the psychic nature and the restraint of the chitta or mind. So there's some differences in those translations, and we'll study that a little bit. So before we get into an in-depth study, let me give you my simple interpretation of what these various authors that I'm drawing from have to say about Book 1, Sutra 2. And to let you know, I've also studied 10 different translations, and I've reread and reread many of them over the decades. So here is my summary. What is yoga really all about? In Book 1, Sutra 1, we learn that yoga helps you remember or rejoin with your true nature, what I call your peaceful self. But how does this union or yoga come about? In the introduction to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali video, we talked about many different paths to yoga, and I'm not going to say them all here, but it included the devotional path of Bhatki, the Hatha Yoga path, which has to do with asanas or physical postures. And all of these different paths have an important contribution. But the essence of yoga is really found within this sutra. As you master the mind and its various modifications, the distortions of the mind no longer cloud the reality of who you really are as the peaceful self. The more you are able to restrain, control, or uplift the lower levels of your mind by subduing or illuminating your mind stuff, and most importantly, your ego, the more the self you really are shines through every moment of your life. So how do you subdue or restrain the modifications of the mind stuff? Our three authors have various opinions on this. Bailey states that the most important step is to subdue or calm your psychic or emotional nature. Maybe because that's where most people are. They're driven by their emotions, and we'll get into more discussion on that in a bit. Then all of our authors indicate that you must learn to quiet the mental chatter, the chitta, or it's sometimes it's spelled C-I-T-T-A, that keeps you too absorbed in distracted thought. Next, you need to restrain or illumine all aspects of the ego, which is also known as the ahamkara. All of this is done by moving through the various levels of samadhi, which is talked about throughout the Yoga Sutras, especially in Book 4, but somewhat in Book 1, so that you can reach self-realization, where the observer and the observed, or the seer, the small s and the seer with the large s, become one. That can sound rather complicated at first, but let me illustrate this process to you. So now we're going to take a basic look at levels of consciousness. And this is a model we'll work with a lot. And it looks like it's a step ladder, but that's not really how this process evolves. You don't go step one, step two, step three. But for the sake of simplification, let's just deal with this model as it is for the moment. So first of all, we have three levels that focus primarily on the ego or the selfish levels, also known as the ahamkara. And this is different than me having a sense of individuality. It's when my individuality is primarily selfishly oriented. So it has to do with the physical, my physical body, my physical needs, my physical environment, my physical space, my house, my stuff. The emotions, which Alice Bailey also calls the psychic nature or desire mind, and the mind, my thoughts, 
which have to do with something also called the chitta, the manas, or the mind. So my life is basically about my thoughts, my emotions, my needs, my physical needs. But at some point it shifts to the self, to the spiritual levels. And as it shifts, there are two levels that one begins to abide in. In Buddhism, they call it abiding versus calm abiding, which is when you stabilize there. So you can reach up to these levels, but not necessarily be stabilized there. But eventually at some point, you're stabilized there, you abide there. First of all, in the buddhic plane, which to oversimplify at the moment is just simply the plane of spiritual love and the atmic plane, which is the plane of spiritual will. Let's look at them again in a little different context. So here we have the ego or selfish levels and the ego is also known as the ahamkara. What is the ego about? It's basically that life is all about me. Now, I didn't put it in the text here, but one of the things I really like is the phrase that I learned from the scholar Michael Robbins that the ego plays the see me game. What is the see me game? It's again, see me, because life is all about me. My thoughts, my needs, my emotional pain, my need to look good, my desire to accumulate wealth for myself, my need to survive and get all the power and glory for myself. You matter if you help me have all of the above for myself. Now, I may give some of that to you, but again, the primary reason of giving some of the power or emotional goodies or whatever is so that ultimately you give to me and usually give to me far more than I give to you. This is also a form of narcissism. And we live in a culture in the Western world that is highly driven by ego. And we want to learn through various spiritual practices. We're studying the Yoga Sutras here, but you can get this through the practice of Christianity or the practice of Buddhism or even in Native American traditions. These levels of consciousness are not related to one specific religious tradition. They're levels of consciousness that all human beings are meant to go through. And you'll see that the majority of humanity is at the level of ego, the selfish level, which is also driven primarily by fear versus love. And we want to learn to subdue these levels, to uplift these levels, to infuse and illuminate these levels with the higher spiritual levels of the self, which is what is meant in self-realization. This is also called the buddhic nature in Buddhism, the Christ consciousness in Christianity. And here it's about self-realization, which is my life is about oneness. I am connected to the whole, so I serve the good of the whole and I love the whole. It's not all about me, it's all about we, which essentially is all about the oneness but not just in a blanket oneness where everything has to be the same. It's not uniformity where we're all one form. It's unanimity where there is a diversity of expression. But because we reside on the level of consciousness of the buddhic and the atmic planes, we can appreciate that diversity and work with that diversity to help each aspect of diversity grow fully into its wholeness into its realization of oneness, so that it's one glorious outpicturing of the self that we always are, and we're simply becoming awake to. So we learn to shift from the lower levels of the physical, the emotional, and the mental, which constitute the ego, the ahamkara, up into the spiritual levels of buddhi, or spiritual love, that's also Christ consciousness, and into Atma, spiritual will. Here I have them out pictured again, the physical, emotional, mental, buddhic, and atmic. Now, how do we make this shift where that arrow is? How do we get to the higher levels? We do it through Samadhi. Samadhi is basically the means by which the mind is focused, subdued, 
illuminated and uplifted into the spiritual levels where the self is realized. As that self is realized, the observer and the observed become one. Samadhi is basically different levels of concentrated focus of meditation. And as you will see, as you are trained in the different levels of Samadhi, that goes from a focus of concentration with an object to focus on, such as a seed thought or a mantra or a candle or a picture of a saint or a guru, to seedless, without seed, without object, meditation or Samadhi. And so it's important right now at the get-go because people get confused. They hear the word samadhi or they see that there's all these different kinds of meditation and they get very confused. Well, there are many different forms and kinds of meditation or even formless meditation or formless realms of samadhi depending upon how you are trying to use a particular technique to help you move from a particular level to another to achieve different levels of self-realization. Now, another thing that's important to understand is that as you make this shift, yoga is primarily a science and it is a science because as you see already outlined in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, there are very specific steps we have to take that lead to results that are predictable and reliable, which is part of science, that something is predictable and reliable. If you do this, then in all likelihood, you will achieve that. But it's a science of the heart more than the mind. And this is an extremely important distinction to understand. Why? Because the ego is primarily about the head, the mind. The ego in its sum total uses the mastery of the mind or psychic powers and these are things talked about in book three of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and book three there's four books with a number of sutras in each averaging around 50 sutras in a book. Each book talks about certain things that you can achieve through yoga. Book three is a lot of the mind powers. It's the science of the mind. And the problem with that is you can get a lot of intellectual knowledge and become very full of pride. Look at me, see me, see how smart I am. Or on the flip side, the ego can continue to play the see me game by being too inferior. See how dumb I am. So I just don't understand and use that as an excuse to not understand instead of as a motivation to understand. And understanding is very much a part of the science of the heart, but the ego will block that. At the level of mind, the thoughts tend to be either judgmental and critical or undeveloped and naive. So I may be heart motivated, but I'm stupid about how to go about it. So I see somebody injured, but I'm helpless as to know how to stop the bleeding because my mind isn't developed enough, even though my intention through my heart to help them is a good one. I'm trying to grow many beautiful plants in my meditation garden, but I don't understand the difference mentally of what each plant needs in the way of light or shade or the amount of water or the lack of water or the uh, a kind of nutrients. So I'm not able to use the mind in service of the heart. And therefore I become judgmental and critical, undeveloped and naive. And because I'm primarily at the levels of the ego, my emotions are not calm in a way that that heartfelt love just streams through them with compassion and grace and understanding and wisdom and right action. Instead, my emotions are reactive and full of triggers, full of wounds that I've not taken the time to heal. And so I'm, I'm jumpy or reactive. I'm overly emotional or too flat emotionally by not having developed enough empathy. Again, by being locked too much in the mind and suppressing the emotions. Also, at the level of the ego, the physical body receives too much focus or 
not enough focus to be of any use. So yoga can become all about the perfect body I get from the perfect asanas that I know how to master or postures is another word for asanas I know how to master. And the people that don't have that perfect body, oh my gosh, you know, they're not really good yogis because they didn't get that perfect body, you know, uh, or, you know, I'm sick and debilitated and therefore I'm just helpless and not able to do anything constructive of service in the world or not able to develop my mind or my heart for the sake of service in the world. So I just lie there helpless versus those who may have some sort of disability who are actually incredible examples of yoga masters. They may not be able to do a single yoga posture, but they have developed the science of the heart. And that science of the heart is the science of the self on spiritual levels. Coming from the heart means that you seek to understand, that you develop compassion, and you use the will to strengthen others to progress. Now, it's very important to understand that it is very useful to have a well-educated mind so you know how to understand others. You know how to strengthen others so they can progress. You have a mind that's filled with compassion because you know the reason why people act the way they do, and you know how to help them open their hearts and get to the next step. You have used your mind and your heart combined to heal your emotional wounds and patterns so they're no longer full of triggers and your emotions are not suppressed. They become the perfect vehicle of expression of divine love. And you've learned whatever kind of physical body you have, one that can really master yoga asanas and postures really, really well through the Hatha Yoga practice that we talked about in the introduction to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. You can do that really well, but not so that you can prove to everybody what a hot looking body you have or what great powers you have or you know, what great mastery you have over your physical body, you can stop your heart, etc. All of this is actually very irrelevant to the point that having a physical body has been made fit and equipped for service. So you have a body that basically can go anywhere and everywhere and serve as needed. And you have that mastery over your body so that you can do that. Or if you have a body that is disabled in some way, in a sense, you know how not to put too much attention on that because the service matters more and your heart leads you there. So even if you are suffering an illness, for example, uh, you may be a mother with cancer, you are still able to show up every day for your children with a full heart of love. And that love actually helps you heal your immune system. And it also helps you have humility and empathy for everybody else who's suffering some sort of physical difficulty the way you are. So it's really important to understand that this yoga is a heart yoga, not a naive heart, but a fully empowered, strengthened heart. The word courage means take heart. You are able to take heart in whatever situation you're in and use whatever you have equipped in the way of your mind, your emotions, and your physical body to the fullness of love and service, spiritual love and spiritual will in the world. That's what this shift is all about. That's what the Yoga Sutras are trying to get you to cultivate. Let's now look at what the various authors have to say on the three books that I'm using. And again, I'm giving you a very short understanding of what these books say. Why? Because I want you to read the commentaries for yourself. But I want to give you the pithy points that I find are most essential to our understanding. So, Sri Swami Satchidananda has interpreted this sutra as meaning the restraint of the modifications of the mind stuff is yoga. And the key thoughts are that Sri Swami Satchidananda says that this one sutra is enough because the rest of the sutras explain this one only in greater detail. That is so significant. This video is probably the longest video I'm going to do on all the sutras, precisely for this reason, because it is so important. Now, 
he emphasizes what we've already talked about, that the restraint of the mind stuff does not just mean one's thoughts, but the ahamkara or the ego, the I feeling, or the separated sense of self from the whole. He goes on to say that this ego once mastered gives rise to booty on the higher levels. And I've illustrated that for you. So hopefully you are getting a better sense of that. If we do not do this, get to the higher levels, the lower levels of the mind, including the desiring part of the mind, that kama manas, that emotional mind, take over. Then we get locked into the five senses, believing we are no more than the body and the senses themselves. Now that to me is fascinating because the materialistic viewpoint that all we are is the body and the brain is actually a reflection according to the interpretations of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali that the shift has not been made into buddhi and into atma, into the buddhic and atmic realms. And therefore, there's no understanding of that oneness, of that level of consciousness that exists beyond the brain, beyond the body. And so there's just simply being locked into those lower realms of the ego, that isolated sense of I. We are trying to overcome that through meditation, through going through the various levels of samadhi, that in a scientific way, through these experiments, prove to ourselves the reality of the oneness that we are and the illusion of the ego as a separated sense of I and the five senses as being simply locking us within the materialistic universe and the body and the brain. That is why yoga is so important. Through the various samadhis you train the mind. As you do this you realize what Sri Swami Satchidananda says, quote, the entire outside world is based on your thoughts and mental attitude. The entire world is your own projection. That is why yoga does not bother with changing the outside world. As the mind, so the person. Bondage or liberation are in your own mind. If you feel bound, you are bound. If you feel liberated, you are liberated. Things outside neither bind nor liberate you. Only your attitude towards them does that. Now it's important to understand that he's not saying that I create my reality. So everything that happens out there is simply what I've created out of my own mind. What he's saying is whatever happens out there, the attitude you have towards what's happened, because it's not always your creation, though you may have set up certain things that lead towards that. You are not isolated creating the reality out there. We, the oneness, the wholeness that we are, creates that reality through the expression of many people. So sometimes it is my deliberate actions that have caused a certain reality to happen. And sometimes it isn't what I've done. It's the group collective and what's happened. But I decide whether I am liberated in whatever experience I am. I can be in a concentration camp and become liberated or a prison and become liberated or I can be wealthy and have everything I want and become liberated or I can be wealthy and have everything I want and be bound or I can be in a jail or a concentration camp and be bound. The difference is not any outer circumstances. It's the attitude that you approach it with. Let's examine that a bit more. He goes on further to talk about how this shift in how you approach any event that happens to you in life in a yogic way is done as follows. Quote, if instead of imprisonment, you think of this as a place for your reformation, where an opportunity has been given you to change your attitude in life, to reform and purify yourself, you will love to be here until you feel purified. Another quote, so if you can have control over the thought forms and change them as you want, you are not bound by the outside world. End of quote. In other words, just as Jesus said, resist not evil. Evil is whatever feels like it's live spelled backwards. E-V-I-L is L-I-V-E, live spelled backwards. So you can view something as anti your life. 
the marriage that you're in or the relationship that you're in or the job that you have or the economic circumstances that you have. You can look at it and say, this is evil. This is something I must resist and I must fight. Or you can say, this is something that is absolutely an opportunity to reform and purify myself, to learn how to love this in an intelligent way. That doesn't mean love it and be abused. It means love it and lift it up into a higher level of consciousness. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was able to do and Gandhi was able to do through their nonviolent expression. That's what we want to do. You know, the Buddhists have a saying that you win the lottery, basically, not by winning $500 million like three people just did here in California where I live in 2015 when I was doing these videos. You win the lottery by getting really difficult people in difficult situations around you because how else are you going to build those muscles? It's like lifting heavy weights in a gym. How else are you going to truly learn to demonstrate that you are loving at a Buddhic level, at a Christ consciousness level, through your Buddha nature. That's what Buddha nature is. You're at the Buddhic plane. Spiritual love. How else are you going to learn to demonstrate spiritual will, which activates itself not through war and violence, but through harmlessness? How are you going to activate that through nonviolence? How best to do that? than by being in adverse situations that you think are adverse to you so that you can really learn to love and to lift into those higher levels of consciousness. That's why Sri Swami Satchidananda says, you will love to be here. You will love to be in this marriage until you learn the lessons of truly loving it. Then you will be liberated from it. But that means truly loving it with intelligence, not just sitting there and being passively abused, but by developing the spiritual will and the spiritual love to basically say, thou shalt love. Thou shalt expand the consciousness in this environment so that everyone recognizes the oneness that we are and any emotional triggers or desire to abuse or control or be violent disappear. So let's explore one of these. You lose a job. Now, that may have been, quote, your fault because of certain things you did, or it may not have been. That's one of the dangers in the create your own reality stuff. And that's why I wrote my book, Beyond the Secret, which is the spiritual use of the law of attraction, because it eliminates this ego idea that I created everything that ever happened to me. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether you created it or not. What matters is how you handle it. If you're handling it at the level of the ego, then physically you'll end up very tired, ill, stressed. Maybe you'll get adrenal burnout. You'll collapse. You won't know how to deal with the loss of the job. Or maybe these things happen and temporarily you're just meant to attend to them so that you can strengthen your body and move forward. But instead of doing that because you're stuck in the poor me level of the ego, you'll uh, just spend way too long in that illness or you won't take care of your tiredness or you won't learn how to take care of your body. You won't learn how to manage stress better. You'll just sit there in it all. At the emotional level, you'll spend an excess amount of time on worry, confusion, or depression. And I have to tell you, worry is one of the most useless emotions there is. Instead, turn your anxiety into action. I had to learn this myself through difficulties in my life and I've had quite some very harsh things happen to me in my life. And I began to learn that every single moment and minute I was wasting on worry was something that wasn't helping me get out of my situation. If instead I got up and did something, I meditated so I could be less confused and prayed, what is it that I'm supposed to do? I did whatever I could to lift myself out of the feeling of depression through exercise or proper nutrition, etc. And instead of worrying, I said, get up and take some sort of action that will lead you into the right direction. So if it's a loss of a job, make sure you get on an unemployment right away. Make sure that you're improving your resume. Make sure that you're improving your contacts that can lead you to a better position. Get yourself better training to get into a, a better position. Send out resumes. 
do whatever you can, but those actions will lead you to where you want to go, not these ego levels of worry, confusion, depression. And mentally, your thoughts will simply run negative. You will feel helpless, as if there's nothing you can do. The people are against you for various reasons, you know, and maybe some of those reasons are real. Maybe there really is some sexism or some racism or some prejudice going on that caused you to lose your job, etc. Maybe that wasn't your fault, but your attitude about it matters. Are you going to let your thoughts run negative? Oh, those people are just all out to get me. Or are you going to spin them in a different direction? So you lose your job. You're stuck in the levels of the ego. Here's what you're doing with your days and your time. Negative thoughts, worry, confusion, depression, tired, ill, stressed, not getting a job, losing more money, not being able to take care of your basic needs, getting more negative, more worried, confused, depressed, tired, ill, stressed. You see where I'm going with this. But worst of all, you are blocking your access to the higher levels of illumination, understanding, spiritual love, spiritual will. You're blocking the help that you need. Now, what does it look like if you're handling this at a spiritual level? Well, how is your way of being different at all these levels? First of all, at the physical level, you're going to take right action. Like I said, it, maybe you did get a little burned out. It was difficult to go through. You will learn to take care of yourself. Maybe your finances are taking a hit. Instead of putting your head in the sand and avoiding it, you will take action to manage your finances, to work with your debt, to talk to creditors, to do whatever you have to do to stop drowning financially. That can sometimes be the physical level as well, not just your body, but getting your physical needs, food, clothing, shelter met. At an emotional level, you will have faith and you'll turn that worry or anxiety into action. And you'll take care of your emotions by processing them through, not avoiding them or wallowing in them, but processing them through. So you can, for example, turn your anger about what happened into the energy to make a difference. You'll be able to turn your depression into compassion for yourself and others. I have a book on this called Feeling Good and Living Great, which is how to handle any emotion well. Mentally, you'll be inspired You'll wake up with thoughts of, I could do this, or I could try this, or I could improve this, instead of negative thoughts. And it isn't just false positive thinking, though positive thinking can help you have better dopamine to help your brain function better. It's also collecting ideas of what to do practically, pragmatically to make it better. And you'll be open to the spiritual levels. Here's one way. On a buddhic level, you'll feel more compassion because of your oneness with all who suffer. When I went through an extremely difficult time, I was in San Diego, California, 30 miles from the Mexican border, and I was having a lot of hard times financially, etc. And I started to lift myself out of it by saying, 30 miles from me, there are people who are getting shot at, literally, to have the life I want to complain about. Now, my life in the United States was pretty miserable compared to most of the people around me. But when I expanded my consciousness to oneness with everybody on the planet, there are children dying for every five words I've said on this video, one child is dying. When you open your heart to that, you get out of your pity party and you really have much more compassion at a booty, spiritual love, Christ consciousness level, whatever you want to call it. That's what your heart opens up to. And at the Atmic level, you see the higher purpose. For me, it was a greater level of humility and a greater understanding of how it was important for me not just to practice my spirituality at what was really the level of the ego, see how smart I am, see how much I can control my emotions, see how much money and prosperity I have, which I used to have a lot of. Instead, it was see the necessity for me to shift to these higher levels, not just in theory, but in fact, more and more in my life. That's the point of the Yoga Sutras, to use this training to practically shift yourself, to use life training to shift yourself into the higher levels of yoga or union with the self that you are, that we all are. Now we're going to get into the interpretations by BKS Iyengar and his 
interpretations are really complicated because he's introducing a lot of terms. And I'm going to mention them here, and it may seem a little tedious to you, but it's really important to get these terms down because that will help you understand what these words mean when you encounter them in various yoga traditions, or even when you want to translate them to other spiritual or religious tra traditions, you'll be able to understand it better. Here we go. Bkyas Iyengar interprets this sutra as meaning yoga is the cessation of movements in the consciousness. So he's not so much saying the mind stuff, he's saying to stop the movements in the consciousness. Here's a quote from him. Restraining the fluctuations of the mind, which is similar to what Sri Swami Satchidananda has said. Yoga is the restraint of the modifications of the mind. Restraining the fluctuations or modifications of the mind is a process which leads to an end, samadhi. Now remember, there's more than one samadhi. So Iyengar goes on. Initially, yoga acts as a mean of restraint. So he's emphasizing that. When the sadhaka, the one who practices yoga, has attained a total state of restraint, yogic discipline is accomplished and the end is reached. The consciousness remains pure. Thus, yoga is both the means and the end. So we're learning to restrain those lower levels of the ego, or another way to say it is we're really illuminating them so that those lower levels of the ego are purified. Because they're pure, they're more able to shine and reflect that which is the higher levels of consciousness the pure levels of consciousness. So yoga is the means to get there and it's the end process. Samadhi is the means to get there and it's the end process. As we learn more about these sutras, you will discover again that there are several different kinds of samadhi which lead the mind from focused concentration into greater absorption into union with the self. Reading more from Iyengar, we see that he introduces a lot of terms that I will continue to illustrate in these videos. For example, he says, Chitta is the vehicle which takes the mind, manas, towards the soul, Atma. Now, I just illustrated this for you. So get this locked into your visual and auditory and kinesthetic awareness that Chitta is mind, is manas, and the goal is to lead you to Atma or to the higher levels of the soul. Buddhi possesses the decisive knowledge which is determined by perfect action and experience. So he's defining a little bit more what the buddhi plane is. I've called it spiritual love so far, but he's saying that buddhi or buddhi consciousness also means that you have decisive knowledge which leads to perfect action. So I have the ability to utilize the mind through the heart. So when I see you injured on the side of the road, I just don't simply say, oh gosh, through my heart, poor person, let me pray for you. I say, hmm, let me put a tourniquet on you to stop the bleeding. And if I have the knowledge, let me reset the bone, perfect action and experience. And then let me hold that space of spiritual love. Let me pray. Let me meditate with you until more help arrives. You see how that goes? Let's go on with the quote from Iyengar. The thinking principle or conscience, the antakarana link, the motivating principle of nature mahat to individual consciousness, which can be thought of as a fluid enveloping ego, ahamkara, intelligence, booty, and mind manas. What does that say? I'm going to continue to illustrate it for you, and I'll do it in the next few slides. Basically, he's saying that we get to mahat, and I'll show you what that is, by moving through the antakarana, which takes us from the ego, the ahamkara, to mahat, which takes us from manas to buddhi. Let's look at the next quote. If ahamkara, ego, is considered to be one end of a thread, then antaratma, the universal self, or the atma, is at the other end, and the antakarana is the unifier of the two. He also says the practice of yoga integrates a person through the journey of intelligence and consciousness from the external to the internal. It unifies him from the intelligence of the skin to the intelligence of the self, so that his self merges with the cosmic self. This is the merging of one half of one's being, Prakriti, with the other, Purusa. So this is similar to what 
was being said by Sri Swami Satchidananda that we're no longer externally focused with the five senses, with the materialistic worldview. Instead, we're internally focused. We realize that inner intelligence is no longer the intelligence of the skin, it's the intelligence of the self. And Iyengar is introducing a couple more terms which I'll illustrate, Prakriti and Purusa. All right, here we go. So here you have the ego, the ahamkara, excuse me, the ahamkara, the selfish levels. Now these levels are also known as prakriti. Okay, so this is just another way to summarize the ego, prakriti. Mahat is basically leading us into the mahatma or the atmic plane. You know, when somebody's called a mahatma, it means that they learn to live through all of these levels and express spiritual will, the Atma. And how did they do that? By going through the Antakarana or the Rainbow Bridge. So sometimes you hear this phrase, Rainbow Bridge. Now you know what it means. It's the ability to bridge in consciousness. It's not an actual bridge you build. You bridge in consciousness so that you can lift from the ego to the self or spiritual levels or the purusa. You go from prakriti to purusa, from the ego to the self, from the selfish levels to the spiritual levels. How do we do it? We go through the rainbow bridge. We build the antakarana. That's what Iyengar is saying. I hope it's getting simpler for you as you see the visuals. Now, I have to tell you, Iyengar goes on and gives us a whole bunch of other terms, which I'm going to briefly mention, just because when you're reading his book, you'll get a little lost later on if you don't understand some of these terms. And that is, he's saying, humans are composed of five sheaths or kosas. And he lists what they are here. The anatomical or the anamaya, maya means illusion, which is the uh, earth anamaya, the illusion of the earthly anatomical nature. The physiological, the pranayama, the water nature. The mental, which is the manomaya, or fire nature, the intellectual. The vijnana maya, the air nature. The blissful, which is the ananda maya, the ether. So don't get too caught up, but just learn these terms for right now. And I've put them here in this particular illustration as well. So the physical level is the anatomical, the ananda maya, the earth. Emotional, the psychic nature, desire, mind, physiological, pranayama, water. Mental is the manamaya, the fire, the chitta, the chitta, the man is the mind. Oh my God, all these different terms. I know it can make you feel a little crazy. I'm not going to be doing this in other videos. This is the most complicated video. This is the most important sutra. Hang in there. We're almost done with all these complex terms. The buddhic, the intellectual, the vijnanamaya, the air, the atmic, the blissful, the anandamaya, the ether. Now, one little digression. I am saying these Sanskrit names as best as I can. Nobody has ever said them to me, so I probably am messing some of them up. I understand that. I'm more than willing to learn the correct pronunciation of them. So a little bit of booty heartfelt slack for the part of my mind that may be a little uneducated here, and I'm happy if somebody would teach me the correct way of saying it. And also, I'm happy for your appreciation that I'm doing my best. There you have the Antakarana or the Rainbow Bridge. Now we're getting into the last book. Almost there. Almost done. This union or yoga is achieved through the subjugation of the psychic nature and the restraint of the chitta or mind. Alice Bailey. Now, notice in her interpretation, Bailey concurs with the others but makes some refinements by laying more emphasis on distinguishing between the mind, the chitta, and the emotions or the psychic nature, and how they both must be handled through subjugation and restraint. Whereas Sri Swami Satchitananda talks about restraining the desiring part of the mind, Bailey gives it the phrase the psychic nature, and I mentioned earlier a phrase the sage Sri Aurobano also uses the psychic nature. Bailey also refers to this emotionally colored mind as Kamamanis or desire mind. And I've already talked about this earlier on in this video. 
So what is this desire mind? Let's take a look at it a little bit more because Bailey emphasizes it much more in her particular interpretation of the sutra. Remember the desire mind is related to the emotions and what's also called the psychic nature. We are in the desire mind when our mental processes are clouded with desire and emotion. The desire mind is like the Buddhist version of the hungry ghost, and these are creatures with small mouths and large bellies, symbolizing their constant discontent and hunger for more, regardless of how many desires are fulfilled. And we've really set up Western society based upon this. What is the goal in Western society, which is primarily materialistic and confined to the five senses and the external? It's to have more stuff. He who dies with the most toys wins. The billionaires are the ones who are celebrated. We don't ask what their value systems are. We don't examine what their level of consciousness is. We don't see if they're using their great wealth to help the good of the whole instead of the part. We don't ask if people are getting that wealth by exploiting the world's resources and making it difficult for other people to live. Some of us do ask those questions, but in general, the overall ideology of society is don't ask, just get stuff, get money, and glorify the people who got there. Doesn't matter how they got there, just they got there. Good for them. But the interesting thing is, and a lot of happiness research is showing this, even when they get there, because of how they got there, they're not that happy. They're actually full of paranoia, they're still full of desire, emotional desire, and chances are they're getting more and more locked in that brain. And because they're using a lot of coping mechanisms to deal with the lack of happiness, like drugs or alcohol or smoking or sex addiction or whatever, their brains are actually atrophying. So this is one of the problems here. Uh, I recommend Change Your Brain, Change Your Life by uh, Dr. Amen if you really want to know how the brain is affected by this hungry ghost syndrome. Also, when these desires are not met, the tendency is to feel wounded, depressed, or upset. You could also, I didn't put this in here, get angry or competitive or more aggressive or vengeful because you didn't get your way. Now, this causes us to swing up and down from pleasure to pain. And this is a process we are taught to overcome later in, I should say, in later Yoga Sutras. It doesn't mean that you can't experience pleasure or you won't have pain. It just means, to use a Buddhist phrase, you're not attached to it. You know how to sit with that pain, and the key is sit with it, not ignore it or avoid it. You know how to sit with it with compassion. And you no longer get addicted or attached to things that bring pleasure. You enjoy them, you let them go. You enjoy them, you let you go. Kind of like Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. You see how a lot of these things were being taught in all kinds of various ways are all the same? That's one of the things I'm trying to show you here is the synthesis of this practice as we go through Yoga Sutras. But Bailey emphasizes much more that this is really the first step for most of us is we need to work through the desire mind, the emotional nature, and we work it through. We don't suppress it. We work it through before we can even begin to work with the mind. This union or yoga, again, is achieved through the subjugation of the psychic nature. Now, that doesn't mean suppression. It can be interpreted that way. It means learning how to work effectively with the psychic nature and the restraint of the chitta or the mind. So, Bailey is making these further distinctions on the various levels of mind. And these are more details, I'm sorry, important to understand. You have the psychic nature of the desire mind, which we've already been exposed to, which is mostly emotional and subject to pleasure and pain. Then you have, she's dividing the mind up a little bit more. You have the lower concrete mind, which is the fact-finding, logical, scientific mind. You have the abstract mind, which is the theoretical patterning mind. So she's dividing the mind into these two levels, abstract and lower concrete. And then you have the buddhic mind, which is discerning, love-filled, all-inclusive, wise mind. So here we're, uh, again, getting our levels. Just want you to see that. But we're dividing the mind, the level of the mind, into two more levels. 
concrete and abstract. So that's important to understand those additional divisions on that level of mind when you're going through her interpretation of the Yoga Sutra. So these comprise the ego or the ahamkara. On the level of the abstract mind, one begins union with what she calls the egoic lotus. She's introducing yet another concept, which is an individualized sense of soul or a spiritualized version of me. Now we're going to have to really understand this distinction as we go along because the ego can grab a hold of spiritual ideas and come up with a spiritualized version of me and my importance. I believe in the oneness of everything that is. Give me everything I want materially so I look good, feel good. I've got the right car. I've got all the money I want. I got the right chick or the right guy. I got the right status. You're all thinking I'm so wonderful spiritually. It's still an appropriation at the level of the ego. At some point, the sense of individual soul, my individualized spiritual self, is dissolved as one takes up residence on the buddhic plane and taps into the next level of mind she talks about, which is buddhic mind, or direct knowing based on identification with the one. It's real different to say, I'm one with everything that is, and to live knowing you are one with everything that is. You, the way you live changes dramatically. The way you use your thoughts, the way you use your emotions, the way you use your physical body, your physical resources in life, the way you live is dramatically different if you're identified with the one versus just simply using the abstract mind to say, oh, I'm one with everything. Real different and important shift. From the booty plane, one then reaches into the Atma where even truer sense of oneness or yuga or union is attained. So <clears throat> here I'm breaking out the lower mind and the higher mind or the lower concrete mind and the higher abstract mind a little bit more by bringing in a more complete version of Bailey's system. And that means I'm having to introduce the causal body. The causal body, which is also known as the egoic lotus or the soul body, is that individualized sense of spiritual self. And it has a number of different petals which introduce even more refined levels of consciousness that one has to unfold or develop before they get into the buddhic and the atmic planes. This chart really exists within the mental plane only. That's important for you to understand. Now this causal body is known as the egoic lotus. And you can see that in the lotus system used in Buddhist traditions and in the mystic rose system because the flower used in Christianity is the rose used there. So it's not a brand new idea that Bailey came up with. It's used in other spiritual religious traditions. Now, I'm not going to get into all of this, but I mentioned, you see that little idea of that egoic lotus with the red and blue petals in there? You see that these are actually a system that goes way beyond even what is briefly being talked about in Iyengar and also in Sri Swami Satchidananda's interpretations. That doesn't mean that Sri Swami Satchidananda or BKS Iyengar didn't know about this. It's just they didn't illustrate it. So what Bailey has done is said that there are seven different levels on the physical plane. And you see that red arrow? You can see there's seven different levels there with that one little triangle there. There are seven levels on the emotional plane. I'm using orange there. Seven levels on the mental plane. And that's where we saw the uh, egoic lotus. Seven levels on the buddhic plane. Seven levels on the atmic plane. And she introduces two other planes which are talked about by some of these other authors. But these are considered uh, so subtle that they're considered not manifest yet for humanity. And that's the monadic plane and the plane of Adi. And I don't want to go into the distinctions of all that. We're pretty much just going to stay with the physical, emotional, mental, and buddhic, and only a little bit the atmic as we go through these video series. Whew, you made it. 
Again, that's probably the longest video I'm going to do because it's the most important sutra and the most complicated. It will probably never be this complicated or nearly as long. But having said that, as I create these sutras and these commentaries, I'm really trying to get you to focus on meditating on it. Remember, Sri Swami Satchidananda says it. It's important not just to do this as a study, but as a practice. And that's why for each one of these sutras, quite a lot of work, I'm developing a meditation that goes with each sutra. Now, this would be way too long of a video if I attach the meditations to the commentaries that I've made on the sutras. So at this point, please look for the meditation called Contents of Consciousness that goes with this particular sutra. And you're encouraged to practice it on a daily basis for one week during your study of this particular sutra, Book 1, Sutra 2. Now, this will either be sent to you if you're doing this course with me. When I am first letting this series go in 2015, some of these will be up for free on the internet. You can find it there. Perhaps later I'll have changed my mind and I'll only be delivering it to people that are signed up for this training. Wherever, please look for this meditation in a separate video and start to practice it now.